to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ amos said a lion has roared who can but fear the lord god has spoken who can but prophesy amos chapter 3 verse number 8 welcome to our study of the minor prophets today as we think about the book of amos we'll be looking at god's power-packed messages through Amos the prophet to Israel encouraging them, pleading with them to make their way right before Almighty God. The Gospel of Christ, of course, is an evangelistic work. We're so glad you've joined us. This evangelistic work is brought to you by Churches of Christ. As always, today's lesson is overseen by the elders of the Central Church of Christ in McMinnville, Tennessee, and we hope that you'll maybe go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We've got free CDs and DVDs that we offer there, as well as lessons you can download from your computer, transcripts, outlines, a whole host of Bible study material that no doubt will benefit you in growing closer to God and His Word. Again, thegospelofchrist.com or you can contact us through the information given at the end of this broadcast. And as always, we want to encourage you, wherever you are, wherever you're hearing this lesson at, visit the Church of Christ in your area. You'll find people who love the Lord and love the book, who'd be glad to get to know you better and, and help you in any way in your journey to know God and His will better. Amos is a very interesting book. As we think about Amos, Unlike some, he wasn't really a professional prophet in the sense that it had kind of been his heritage and that's what his family had always done. No, he was more like a, a farmer, more like a nurseryman, more like a tree dresser, we might say. Amos chapter 7 verse 14 says he was the tender of sheep and of trees. He dealt in forestry. He dealt in farming. He was a, a type of person that a lot of us would probably get along pretty well with, and thus he wasn't professional in that sense. But boy, what a message Amos indeed had. Amos chapter 4, verse 12, kind of illustrates the heart of the book where God says through Amos, Prepare, O Israel, prepare to meet your God. Amos is all about preparation in the sense that you cannot escape the consequences of sin against God or others, and you must always be prepared. Now, the idea of preparation and really being prepared to meet God is something we all can take to heart, and here's how. Friend, I'm not sure, nor are you, how long you'll live and how long I'll live. And the Bible says our life like a vapor. James 4, verse 14, 70, maybe 80 days, some 90 or 80 years, some 90, verses 10 through 12. I don't know how long I'm going to live, nor do you, but here's what I do know. Life is very brief, and this is my one and only chance to get right with God. Israel is being appealed to by God through the prophet Amos. Prepare, get ready. If things don't change, Destruction is imminent and you need to prepare yourself and be ready in the sight of God. Let's think then about some of the living messages of Amos. How does Amos apply to Christians living in the, uh, the age of Christianity, following the covenant of Christ? How does an Old Testament prophetic book, power-packed book of, uh, appeal to us today and apply to us today? Think about some of its practical messages with me for just a moment. The book of Amos shows us just how far sin had gone in the times of Israel. I want you to notice Amos chapter 1, verse number 13. The Bible says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of the people of Ammon, and for four I will not turn away its punishment, because they ripped open the women with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge 
their territory. What was going on during the time of Amos and the time of Israel and the nations, no doubt, in context around them? Well, they had reached a pretty, pretty bad low. They'd reached a pretty deep spot spiritually. They were ripping open women with children to enlarge their own borders and to cause their enemies to decrease. Basically, they were causing forced abortions. How did God feel about that? God says, for three transgressions, yes, for four, I'm going to punish the people of Ammon. What's a practical lesson we learn from this? The killing of the unborn, whether forced or not, is never, ever approved by God. Abortion, the sin that goes along with that, the tragedy, the atrocity, is something God loathes. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19, the shedding of innocent blood God hates. Let me give you another example. Exodus chapter 22, verse 21 through 23. The context is God's giving some various laws to Israel about restitution and judgment and things of that nature. And, and He shows here that if two men are fighting and one of them brings harm to a woman with child and she loses that child, two men fight, one of them hits a woman accidentally or she gets hurt in the fight and the pregnant woman loses her child and it dies because of that. What is that man who caused that injury to that unborn child to do? Life for life. God says eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life, wound for wound, stripe for stripe, burn for burn. What's God saying? Life for life. The life of that adult man is to be forfeited for the life of that unborn child. Friend, don't let anybody deceive you or dupe you into thinking that abortion is okay with God. Never, ever is that the case in Scripture. Psalm 127, verses 1 through 3, children are a gift from God, not something to be aborted, tossed aside, put in a medical trash bag and taken out. No, that's, that's not the way God intended it. Life is special, every life. And when one enters into the actions that create that, there is a certain amount of responsibility, a big amount of responsibility, that goes along with that. And so abortion is not just a choice. It's not just uh, getting rid of human skin. No, that's not it. It's murder in the sight of Almighty God. And so look at how low some of the people in the book of Amos had actually stooped. Now, a second lesson that we learn that applies to us today from the book of Amos is we see just how stubborn Israel was and how that led to their ultimate downfall. Notice Amos chapter 2, verse number 12. The scripture says, look how stubborn they were. You gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets saying, do not prophesy. Well, what's the problem here? A Nazarite was someone who set himself apart. He wasn't going to cut his hair. He wasn't going to drink any grape juice or wine. He, wasn't, he was going to follow other restrictions just so that he could live a life especially set apart for God. Well, what were the people of Israel doing? They're saying to the Nazarite, here's some wine, drink it. What were they saying to the prophets? They were saying, in essence, don't prophesy to us. We don't want to see people trying to live special lives. We don't want to hear the message of God anymore. Let's put all that aside. Look at how stubborn how rebellious they had come. And friend, when we think about being stubborn in rebellion, let's realize today that God still despises those sins. Let's not say to ourselves, I'm going to have it my way. Let's not say God won't care. Let's not say, well, times are different now. No, God still expects us to do what He says. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. But he who does the will of the Father in heaven. We also learn a very important lesson about unity and what real unity is in the book of Amos. Notice Amos chapter 3, verse number 3, this question is asked. Can two walk together unless they are agreed? Well, what's God's point there? Israel, you can't walk hand in hand with me. We can't be in a relationship, you and I, unless there's an agreement there. Well, is God going to agree with That's not the idea. They have to come to God's terms. They have to do what God wants them to do for there to be real unity. How is unity to be achieved today? Here's how. We're to endeavor 
to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What is that bond of peace? The gospel of peace? That which creates peace between man and God, the good news of Jesus Christ. And so unity is not just everybody hugging or everybody holding. That's not unity. What's unity? Unity is when man comes to God's terms, there's unity between man and God, and then there can be unity between others as well. And so unity at any price? No. Unity in diversity? Of course not. Unity, God's way, through His plan and through His message. Another power pack lesson that we learn from the book of Amos is when God speaks, men must hear and listen. Do you remember Amos 3 verse 8 again? A lion has roared. Who can but fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Imagine this. Imagine you're in the zoo. And it happens usually when you go, you hear the lion roar. No matter where you are, you stop for just a minute and you think to yourself, I'm glad he's behind that fence. That lion roaring gets your attention creates a little fear within you, and rightfully so. What's God trying to say? Just like when the lion roars, everybody looks up and gets a little bit afraid. When God speaks, who can but prophesy? The roaring of the lion is likened unto the, the powerful voice of God that ought to create fear, respect, awe, and reverence for Almighty God within our hearts. What's that mean? How do we apply that today? When God speaks, let's listen. Let's hear. Revelation 2 and 3, God says to the seven churches of Asia, Him that has an ear to hear, let him hear. The Scripture says in Hebrews 4 verse 12 that the Word of God is, is living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. How? Piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit. Join tomorrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Look at the power of God's Word. We're to receive with meekness the implanted Word, which is able to save your souls. Jeremiah cried out. In Jeremiah 22, verse 29, O earth, 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 hear the Word of the Lord. Friend, that same cry given through Amos is so true for us today. It doesn't matter what society thinks. It doesn't matter what people who are popular think. What really matters? What does the Word of God say? What has the Lord said? The Bible is God's only way to salvation, and we must give attention to it. Now, let's think for just a moment about that key verse that we mentioned, Amos chapter 4, verse number 12. I want to turn your attention to that, and I want you to notice what Amos here says, Amos 4, verse 12. Therefore, God says, Thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. What's God talking about? He's going to take some like a firebrand and pluck them out of the fire. He's going to take some and prepare them for destruction. The message here is really this. God's saying to Israel, I've given you chances. I've given you time. I've warned you over and over again. Here's what's about to happen. Get ready for it. The point is not uh, down the road. There's a time you need to get ready for, so get ready now. No, the, the point is this. It's imminent. It's at the doorstep. They're knocking on the gate. Prepare to meet your God. For some, it was too late. Some had lived in sin, squandered their time and talent and their efforts, and were ultimately going to be lost because of it. Now, friend, that time may not be knocking at the door as we think it is in the book of Amos, but we never know. What's the point we learn here? Don't let it be too late for you. Don't let it be too late for me. Sometimes some people live too long. They live just long enough to be unfaithful. Some die too soon. They never hear the gospel. Some never avail themselves to the opportunity. Here's what we're trying to drive home. All I've got promised and all you've got promised is right now. What does 2 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2 say? Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Don't postpone. Don't say, I'll do it tomorrow. Don't make excuses. Go away for now. I've got a more, when I have a more convenient time, I'll call upon you. 
Acts 26, 28. We need to obey God with the urgency. The urgency of knowing this may be the only opportunity that I get. And so the idea of prepare to meet your God is not let's take the time and get ready. It's for some, as in the book of Israel, it was too late. Don't let that be you. Listen to Jesus' words in Mark chapter 8. Verses, Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Jesus asked this question. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world, loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Too many people are out trying to gain the whole world. Friend, your soul is the most important thing you've got. Make it a priority today to make sure that you're right with Almighty God before it's too late. As we think then about the book of Amos, another power-packed lesson we learn from the prophet Amos is we must never get lax or lazy or put our trust in the wrong things, spiritually speaking. Notice Amos chapter 6, verse number 1. The scripture says, Woe to you, who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. God says, woe to those who are at ease. Woe to you who put your trust in notable persons. Put your trust in Mount Samaria. Do you think those things, these, these notable persons, this Mount Samaria is going to save you when tragedy comes? The people had got lax. Everything was okay, they thought. They're living in sin and weren't even worried about it. They had their trust in the nations around them. Little did they know, destruction loomed on the horizon. Friend, let's not go lax or lazy, spiritually speaking. Jesus said in Mark 13, verse 35, What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, be ready. We've got to watch and be ready because we don't know when the Lord might come. No man knows the day or the hour. Matthew 24, verse 34 through 36. We've got to watch and not grow lax because the devil sure isn't going lax. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walks about, roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he made of our. I don't know when Christ is coming. I don't know when the last day is. I, don't, I do know this. The devil is actively, aggressively trying to cause men, and, cause men and women to lose their souls. And so don't get at ease in Zion. Don't say, I'm going to trust in this or that. No. Let's each every day examine ourselves, test ourselves, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, to see if we're really in the faith. Now, another practical lesson, another living message from the book of Amos deals with the great spiritual famine that was going on then and goes on today just as well. Look at Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12. God said, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. What was going on during the times of Amos? Well, here's the problem. God had delivered His message. He was still delivering that message through Amos. It wasn't as though the message didn't exist. But the people had no thirst or hunger for it. God says there's a famine in the land. What do you mean a famine? Is there no food to eat? No, that's not the point. Is there no water to drink? No, that's not the point. Well, what kind of famine? Famine thirsting after the Word of God. People run to and fro from sea to sea, north and east. Nobody has a real desire for the Word of God. Friend, one of the things that we abundantly see in the New Testament is we must have a spiritual hunger and thirst for the Word of God. Do you remember Matthew chapter 5, verse number 6? Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's how I need to be. That's how we all need to be. Have that, that hungering, that desire, that, that thirsting, that unquenchable desire to know more about the will and the Word of God. 
Jesus illustrated this in Matthew chapter 4. As he was being tempted by Satan, been in the wilderness 40 days, he was hungry. Satan said, if you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Do you remember what Jesus said? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I need to have that, that spiritual hungering and thirsting for the Word of God. Now friend, let's think about it this way. Is there a famine for the Word of God in the land today? I believe there is. I believe you can realize it as well. Worldliness, sin, wickedness, immorality, ungodliness at every turn. Do people really, really have a concern for God's will? Think about it this way. Do people in our world today really, really want to know what God says on certain moral issues? For example, do they really want to know what God says about homosexuality? That men in relationships with men and women in relationship with women, what God says about that? Friend, I'm afraid we don't. The Bible in the long ago said, Leviticus 18 verse 22, that that was not right. That it was an abomination in the sight of God. That if men and men were caught together, according to Leviticus 20 verse 13, they are to be put to death. Romans 1 verses 26 through 28, the Bible clearly teaches that it is ungodly, immoral, it's shameful, and it's deserving of punishment. 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 through 11, the Bible clearly says that homosexuality, homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. They won't go to heaven, the Bible says, if they live that way. But do we want to hear that in society today? Do people have a a hunger for the Word of God when it comes to certain truths the Bible teaches. For example, are people hungry, hungry and thirsty to hear what the Bible says about the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? In a world where it's so ecumenical and everybody just kind of wants to go along to get along and choose the church of your choice, are we hungry to hear what God says about the church? That Jesus built His church. I will build my church, Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 18, that Jesus' church purchased the church with His own blood, Acts 20, verse 28, that there are not a host of denominations that are acceptable to God, that denominationalism is sinful, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 13, and do we really want to hear there's only one church. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, that Jesus is head of the church, which is His body. Now, if Jesus is head of the church and the church is His body, how many bodies are there? Ephesians 4, verse 4, there is one body. Now, friend, I want you to think about this. If the church is the body and there's only one body, how many churches are there? Just one. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, By one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. What's the body? The church. Do we really want to hear that Jesus is head of His church? The churches of Christ greet you? Romans 16, 16. Is there a, a hungering and a thirsting for the Word of God when it comes to matters of salvation? So many people today have the idea the, you know, all you've got to do is love God in your heart. All you've got to do is believe in Jesus and everybody's okay. Everybody's going to be saved. Friend, is that really what the Bible says? Faith alone won't save anybody. Scripture says, James chapter 2, verse 24, we see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Not works where we're going to earn salvation. That's not what we're saying. But the Bible does give some definite conditions. For example, a person not only must believe in Jesus, John 8 verse 24, that person must be willing to repent. There's where people stop listening sometimes. You've got to stop living in sin and turn to God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 7 through 9, the Thessalonians turned from idols to God 
to serve the true and living God. They turned away from sin and turned in the right direction of serving God. Are we willing to repent? Do we really want to hear that today? Are people willing to do what Jesus said, to contact the blood of Jesus? Friend, there's a lot of people who don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. There is a definite famine today concerning baptism. Now, we're not saying baptism is all you've got to do. We've already mentioned you've got to believe. You've got to repent. You, you must make the good confession. Jesus is the Son of God. Uh, Romans 10, verse 10. Friend, let's be just as clear. The Bible does say baptism is essential to salvation, not something done after you're saved. Now, how do we know that? Think about these scriptures with me. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Two conditions, believing and baptizing, and being baptized, then a person saved. John 3, verse 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, cannot enter the kingdom of God. Got to be born of water to get in the kingdom of God. Think about the very first time the gospel was preached. Acts chapter 2, they cried out after they realized they've killed their own Messiah. Men and brethren, what must we do? And here was the answer. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, listen, for the remission of sins. I am to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Think about Saul of Tarsus. Acts 22, 16, Ananias comes to Saul. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's what the Bible says. And of course, 1 Peter 3, 21 says it as clear as any passage. Baptism does now also save us. Friend, are, you, are we really willing to hear the Word of God? Are you a Christian today? If you've never obeyed the gospel, Amos' message appeals to us. Obey God. Prepare to meet your God before it's too late. We hope you'll do that as we study more together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.